is a great turnout. Wonderful uh, on a Wednesday night, on a snowy night, to be able to do something other than worry about the winter that's about to come. So thanks for coming out. And uh, one of the things we always emphasize at Stevenson uh, in the whole time that uh, Ned and I have been here is the idea that we always have to think bigger than what the current reality is. You know, as Donald Trump says, if I'm thinking anyway, I might as well think big. So that's what we try to emulate. And so tonight you thought you were coming to hear Dave Williams, who's actually a big speaker. But we took it even to a higher level. Because Dave Williams is not just the one speaker that we have uh, organized for you. We actually have three speakers organized for you. And actually, this is all a whole part of the whole series. So most hospitals will, as a board, you'll go off and you'll kind of think, what's the future going to be like? What are we going to do in the next five years? What are our plans? What are our dreams? What are our aspirations? What do we want to achieve? And you'll come up with some goals, some objectives, some targets, and you'll go off and work on them. Most boards will do that and they'll have some presentations on the day of the, of the planning retreat. And so what we came up with is a new idea, and that is why don't we open up to the public the same material that the board is going to get at their strategic planning retreat. So let's do it in advance, let's videotape it, let's make it available to the whole community, have a link on it. So tonight you're going to hear the first speaker in a series of three speakers, all of whom are going to prepare the board for the information that's required today to figure out what's the shape of healthcare for the future. So today's session is all going to be about quality, which is what Dr. Williams is going to speak about. Next Tuesday, we have another speaker, Deanne Salwaswalo, who is the Chief Information Officer at Stevenson, Southlake, and York Central Hospitals. We have a combined collective IT approach, and she's going to be speaking about information technology. Where is the electronic health record? What does it mean for Stevenson? Where are we going to go next with it? And a third speaker in the new year is going to be Dr. Kevin Smith, who is currently the CEO of St. Joseph's Healthcare System. He also happens to be the supervisor of the Niagara Health System. If you heard about all the challenges they've had there, he's been appointed their supervisor. So he's an individual who has extensive expertise in healthcare, knows the Ontario environment extensively. He'll be speaking about the healthcare system in Ontario in general, and then what he's doing as a CEO of a very large hospital in terms of system approaches to healthcare. How is he organizing all the elements that he has under his purview to make sure that healthcare services are more dynamic for his community? So those are three sessions, three opportunities to hear exactly what the board is going to hear. And what you're going to find is we're going to post on our website a link, and you can answer some questions. It'll survey monkey. You can go online, and you can essentially advise the board before their strategic planning session on what you would do if you were the board. So not everybody gets to be the board member. We should have a TV reality show about you know, being a board member for a day, try to get a CTV contract. Um, and that could be a post-retirement objective for me after, uh, after something. So you get to be the board for a little period of time. So please give us your feedback. And as uh, um, Scott said, we'd love your email addresses because that's how we'll send you out the information again to remind you to go ahead and give us the feedback. So tonight is all about uh, quality. And uh, Dr. David Williams has an extensive resume, longer than we can go over in uh, the short time I have to introduce him. But he's uh, essentially an aquanaut, an astronaut. He's an emergency physician by background. He's been to uh, Houston. He's lived there for many years, running the NASA Life Sciences Division. A Canadian running an American institution that you would never think the Americans would allow anyone outside the country <laughs> to ever run. And he did that for many, many years. And now he's back in Canada. He ran the uh, Surgical Robotics Division at Master University for a number of years. And now here he is, the CEO of South Lake Regional Health Center. But in that whole course of events, he's also become quite an expert on quality and how the space industry handles quality and what lessons you might be able to take from that and apply to healthcare. And I think it's going to be a fascinating presentation. You're going to really enjoy it. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to uh, Dr. David Williams. Well, thanks very much, Gary. I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, I think it's going to be a really exciting evening. I've got a little bit of everything for you. I've got some material from space, we've got some material from healthcare, and we've got a lot of material to cover on safety and quality and things. And uh, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. It's the first big snowy day of the year and things, but uh, I think it's great to see everyone here. And uh, we're absolutely thrilled at South Lake to be in the great partnership that we are in with Stevenson and I think it's such a great opportunity for both institutions. But let's talk a little bit about my background. I started off many, many years ago 
as a physician working at Sunnybrook. I was the director of the emergency department, trauma team leader, and in 1992 I applied to be an astronaut. And Tom Clausen was the CEO at Sunnybrook in those days, and I went in to see Tom one day in a one-to-one, -one, and uh, Tom said, so how are things going? And I said, well, things are going really well in the Emerge, but I just have to let you know I've applied to another job. And he said, oh, really, what's that? And I said, I've applied to be an astronaut. And you could have heard a pin drop. Right? <laughs> I think he thought that I was crazy. But anyway, I went on to say that this was a dream that I'd had from the time that I was seven years of age and watching Alan Shepard fly in space in the early 1960s. And I thought, what an incredible opportunity to go off and explore. And it was really my passion in space exploration that led me to studying physiology and how the human body adapts to extreme environments. And uh, that led to me going on into medical school and ultimately becoming a clinician. But in 1992, I had a chance to go and really follow my passion. That was flying in space. Healthcare is something that is really complex. It's ever changing. When we join the space program and train as an astronaut, we say you're drinking from the fire hose because they give you the space shuttle operator's manual. It's thicker than the phone book and say you need to read this in the next week. But healthcare, when I trained as a medical student in the 1980s, in another millennium, it's undergone so many changes over the past 20 and 30 years. It's unbelievable. We're now seeing surgical technologies that we could only imagine back then. And I think the challenge that we face is to stay on top of these new technologies, these new processes, and make sure that we're delivering to our patients the best possible health care available. My career is really quite unique. I have the ability to approach managing healthcare from a physician's perspective, but also having had a chance to fly in space, which we refer to as an extreme, harsh, zero fault tolerant environment, and bring the lessons learned in that environment to the healthcare arena, and that's what we're gonna share with you tonight. When you're out in space doing a spacewalk and you're looking at this, and undoubtedly you're very impressed, right? I, mean, I look at that, I'm impressed. It's not me. <laughs> That's actually Bruce McCandless, and he's flying uh, what we call the manned maneuvering unit, which is essentially a jet pack that you have on the, ba the back of your spacesuit, and he flew away from the space shuttle and flew back towards the space shuttle. But it's a great slide to illustrate the extreme nature of what we do in space. When I did my three space walks, I was tethered to the space station at all times, and we, uh, we no longer do this type of activity when we're out in space. But we're working in an extreme vacuum where the temperatures range from minus 200 degrees Celsius to over 200 degrees Celsius. Unbelievable, the thermal swings. It's an extreme vacuum, so if our suit systems fail, the consequences could be catastrophic. We're exposed to micrometeoroids, we're exposed to radiation, and needless to say, our ability to survive in this environment is critically dependent upon teams of people functioning together flawlessly to achieve excellence in every aspect of what they do. So the lessons that we learn in this environment can directly help us in healthcare. Now I know many of you are interested in what it's like to sit on top of essentially a controlled explosion. Seven and a half million pounds of, of thrust coming from the, uh, the main engines and the solid rocket boosters taking you from being stationary to eight and a half minutes later traveling 25 times the speed of sound. Now, how fast is 25 times the speed of sound? I some of you are probably Googling it as I'm saying this. But anyway, if you snap your fingers, the space shuttle will go eight kilometers. It's eight kilometers a second. Your average rifle bullet travels a little under a kilometer per second. So I can tell you, I personally have traveled eight times the speed of sound each time I was out performing my spacewalks on the International Space Station. We orbit the Earth every 90 minutes. So an hour and a half later, I've gone around the world once. Truly remarkable. The guests that come to watch us lift off at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, they're stuck in traffic trying to get back to the hotels. We've gone around the world once. It's unbelievable when you think about this. So my first space flight was in 1998, and I joined the program in 1992, trained as a mission specialist, flew in space on a mission called Neurolab, dedicated to understanding how the brain and nervous system adapted to microgravity. After that flight, I was asked to be the director of life sciences at Johnson Space Center, and spent about a year in Washington as the deputy associate administrator for the Office of Space Flight. And it was a truly a remarkable experience, and uh, got a chance to learn a lot about all the different aspects of flying humans safely in space. 
space. But arguably one of the most important lessons that I learned is how to work together effectively as a team. And when we go forward and achieve these bold objectives, we do this because we have literally thousands of people like these individuals in mission control that support us when we're out in space. And NASA is all about achieving peak performance by getting the best out of individuals working together in a team environment. The International Space Station, arguably the most complex piece of technology built in the history of the human species, is a result of teams coming together from all over the world. People from different cultures that don't speak the same languages working to build pieces of technology that were assembled for the first time in space. And we talk about the space station as a celebration of technology. Really, in my opinion, it's a celebration of people. It's about people working together and sharing their ideas and coming together to solve complex problems. And I think at some point, someone in the business world will write this up and celebrate the, uh, the true contribution that was made in building the International Space Station. My job on my second space flight, my first one was in 1998, second one was in 2007. I went from being a research scientist in space to being a construction worker, helping build the International Space Station, doing three spacewalks. And that was a remarkable experience because when you're inside the space shuttle to the space station it's one thing going outside is something totally different into this extreme harsh vacuum of space we launch and dock with the International Space Station on the third day of the mission there's Endeavour dock to the forward-facing element of the International Space Station and there's a long central truss that we were working on my first spacewalk you'll notice the Canadian flag on my shoulder my first spacewalk involved going out to the starboard segment of the space station and installing a 2,000 pound truss segment. Um, Charlie Hobaugh, the pilot for our mission, used the Canada arm, the robotic arm that we built and contributed to the space station program to install this. And it was truly an amazing moment. But arguably one of the proudest moments of my life as a Canadian was here on my second spacewalk where I'm riding on the end of the Canada arm holding on to a gyroscope that we need to replace on the International Space Station. The gyroscope weighs 1,200 pounds. I'm holding it in two hands, <laughs> moving it around with fingertip forces. Unbelievable to think that you're capable of doing this. But you have to remember that I'm standing on the end of the Canada arm, and you can see the Canadian logo, big letters down here. So it's on the lower part of the arm. It's on the upper part of the Canada arm. I have the Canadian flag on my shoulder, and I'm hovering over the payload bay of the space shuttle, and I can see Canada on both the upper and lower segments of the space shuttle robotic arm, and Canada on the orbiter boom sensor system and I get back inside from the spacewalk. It was an amazing success. Fyodor Yurchikin, the Russian space station commander, floats over, puts his arm around me and says, Dave, we do really truly understand that in the International Space Station program, the space station is just the base for the Canada arm. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. When you go out to space, there are things that you begin to get a perspective on that's hard to appreciate when you're here on Earth. But you're looking down at a four and a half billion year old planet and you look out at this black infinite void of space and you realize how frail our existence really is, certainly my existence doing a spacewalk, and how appreciative you are of everyone striving to achieve excellence in everything that they do because we really couldn't achieve these amazing objectives if it weren't for that commitment for excellence. At the end of the mission we undock from the International Space Station, move away Away from it. We do a fly around maneuver on the space station to inspect the uh, station and take photographs of it which are analyzed to see if there's micrometeoroid strikes afterwards. But it's at this time that we get a chance to relax and reflect on the amazing beauty of what it's like being in space. Looking down at the northern lights and you can see them dancing over a quarter of the planet, this incredibly beautiful vista of changing panoramic color. And uh, at the end of the mission, of course, we have to come back and re-enter through the Earth's atmosphere. And when you're re-entering, the temperatures around the space shuttle get up in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So you look out the window and you're engulfed in this orange ball of fire. If you've ever wondered what it's like being inside a propane gas barbecue, I can tell you, this is what it looks like. Right? <laughs> Save you the experience. You've always wondered. <laughs> My wife is a professional aviator, she's a captain with Air Canada Fly 767s and in the aviation world we're fully cognizant of the importance of safety and a relentless pursuit of excellence in everything we do because if we're not vigilant the consequences can be catastrophic. 
both in the commercial aviation world and in space flight. So I think what's exciting is look, learning from that experience that I've had working in aviation, working in space flight, and bringing those lessons back into healthcare. When we talk about flying in space, we refer to this as a zero fault tolerant environment and we call that an operational environment. Dan Golden, when he was the administrator at NASA, asked us one time, what do you astronauts mean by an operational environment? And the definition is here. It's an environment that we work in where we make time critical decisions that can have life or death consequences. And we've got the beautiful picture of the space shuttle lifting off. Does that sound kind of like an operating room? Time critical, life or death decisions, emergency room, case room. So I would argue that healthcare we have an operational environment that we work in and the lessons that we learn from space flight and the aerospace industry in that operational world are directly transferable over into healthcare and I think we can learn a lot from this. So what are some of the characteristics of operational environments? The first one is we work in an environment that has many complex systems. And I think what we've seen over the last 30 years in medicine is a significant increase in the use of technology in medicine, but also a significant increase in the complexity associated with that technology. The, also, the other element of this is that human factors are very important. And in aviation, the military, the commercial aviation world, and the human spaceflight world has spent the last 40 to 50 years focusing on human factors in aviation and spaceflight. We're just now beginning to talk about human factors in medicine, how individual decisions can make a difference. So we talk about individual competencies, we talk about teams working together, the importance of institutional culture in achieving safety and quality. And I think these are all important parameters. So if you sit back and you look at this from the broadest perspective, NASA is referred to as a high reliability organization. In other words, we go forward and challenge ourselves to achieve bold objectives in environments that have such a high degree of complexity that catastrophic outcomes would be expected. And of course, we have had catastrophic outcomes in spaceflight, but relative to the magnitude of the challenges that we've undertaken, the number of uh, misadventures that we've had has actually been relatively small. So what are some of the attributes of high reliability organizations? Well, the first one is interesting. Very few people these days feel comfortable mentioning the failure word. Right? In corporate business, we can't talk about failure because shareholders don't like corporate failure. In school, we don't like talking about failing. We only like talking about getting 4.0 GPAs and getting into graduate school and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> what's the issue with high reliability organizations and failure? And we recognize that to be a very um, high reliability organization that succeeds in maintaining excellence, you have to be preoccupied with failure. You have to trap any unexpected consequence as early as possible, understand it and prevent it from going on to becoming a bigger problem. So we're vigilant. We look for even the smallest failures to ask the question, how can we prevent that from occurring? What can we learn from this? How can we improve on it? And I think that's a very important lesson for us in medicine. Root cause analysis is something, again, that's fundamental mental to what we do in the aviation world and yet we're now bringing it into healthcare. We do it at Stevenson, we do it at Southlake and it's something that we're embracing as one of the tools that we can use to achieve safety and quality. But uh, high reliability organizations are very sensitive to operations and they're very sensitive to the expertise of the individuals that work in the, uh, in the operations. So of course in the space program when we talk to our space shuttle commanders, when we talk to our pilots, our flight instructors and things, we defer to their expertise. The same should be true in healthcare where we in management defer to the expertise of our frontline team members, our frontline healthcare professionals. They're the experts. They do this every day and we need to be able to listen from them in terms of how we change the, uh, what's going on. Engagement's absolutely critical. High reliability organizations are very resilient and management <coughs> typically will get out of the office and go around, talk to individuals who are working in the front lines to learn from them and how we can make things a little bit safer. So we talk about creating a culture of safety. 
and uh, I was very fortunate to be part of senior management at Johnson Space Center where a culture of safety is very vibrant. You can feel it as soon as you come on the site. This is the organization that sent humans to the moon and brought them back successfully. This is the organization that dealt with Apollo 13 successfully and we do it by creating a shared culture, a set of values and goals that we focus on on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that we're committed to excellence in the work environment. Very tragically, in 1986, we lost the Space Shuttle Challenger. Even more tragically, in 2003, we lost the Space Shuttle Columbia. In both cases, Diane Vaughn, who's a social scientist at MIT, said that NASA had normalized deviance. Now, I was not involved in senior management in 1986 at NASA. I was working at Toronto General in the emergency room. In 2003, I was no longer in senior management. I was assigned to STS-118. But even with my background in senior management, I find it hard to listen to a comment like that, to say that we in management normalize deviance. And what does she mean by that? Well, basically what it means is that over a period of time, we became accustomed, we started accepting things that we should not have accepted. So in both cases, when in the first one, Challenger, where we had a failure of the O-rings, we'd seen O-ring blow through before we lost Challenger. It's just over a period of time, we came to accept that, and we said the secondary O-ring is there to prevent any problem. Well, unfortunately, both the primary and the secondary O-ring failed in January of 1986. With Columbia, we'd seen foam come off the external tank before and strike the uh, leading edge of the wing of the space shuttle and the tiles on the undersurface of the orbiter. So we said, we've seen this before, we think it'll be okay. And very tragically, we lost the space shuttle. Normalization of deviance, we need to think about it. In healthcare, I would show you an image like this, typical busy emergency room, used to work in an environment like this all the time. And I would sit back at this point in my career and say, you know what, perhaps we've normalized deviance there, where we have patients admitted to a bed in the hospital who stay in the emergency room for hours or days at a time. So yes, in healthcare, we've normalized deviance. And now we need to look for what we would refer to as positive deviance solutions. Because of course, if we can normalize what not to do, perhaps what we can do is find what we need to do and normalize that. So what we're very excited about, both at Stevenson and Southlake, is normalizing positive deviance, finding what works, finding those parts of the hospital that work really well, emulating that behavior in other parts of the hospital. If, it, if we can't find it within our own hospital, let's go somewhere else and ask the question somewhere in the world, someone must have figured out how to do this, let's learn from them and see how we can do it better. And it's all about shifting your culture to make sure that in our culture, we're committed to finding the best possible solutions for our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. So we've spent the last 20 to 30 years in medicine talking about evidence-based clinical practice. What is the scientific data underlying the clinical approach that we use for all of our patients and all the medical conditions we see? I would argue that we're now in a new generation. We've got tremendous scientific data on what we need to do for myriad medical conditions. Perhaps now we should step back and ask, what are we doing for quality-based medicine? And quality-based medicine really suggests to us how we do what we know we need to do. So the science tells us what we need to do. The quality should tell us how we do that for each individual family, developing tailored medical care to meet the needs of each patient that we're treating. So I think what's really exciting is taking these principles from aviation to help us develop the field of quality-based medicine. And it's really all about working together as teams and I think one of the things that's really interesting in teams is empowering teams. So here's, here's a question for you. If you were to go in to any hospital and speak to the senior management team and ask them, do you empower your frontline team? What do you think they're going to say? Of course, yes, everybody does it, right? Do you practice quality health care? Yes, we do. The next question's a little bit harder. How do you do that? How are you empowering your frontline team? What are you actually doing? And I think what's interesting from the story of Gene Kranz, you've probably all seen the movie Apollo 13. Well, when they had the catastrophic explosion of the oxygen cell inside the command service module of Apollo 13, blew out half of the side of the spacecraft, Gene Kranz looked at the team of engineers in mission control, many of whom were in their 20s, and said, failure's not an option, bring them back. Do whatever you have to do, Go and figure it out, bring me a solution. He empowered the team. 
And that's one of the fundamental cultural elements of what we do in the space program. And I think it's critical for us in healthcare to learn that message as well. We hire remarkably talented healthcare professionals, and you've seen them. You've, you've probably been in the hospital and had a chance to work with them. Truly amazing individuals. We need to be able to empower them to come up with the solutions that we, we have to achieve. So empowering team members to find the solutions to safety and quality is something that I think is really important in healthcare. Closing the loop in communication, absolutely critical. Uh, there may be a couple of pilots, I know there's at least one other pilot in the audience here, but there may be a couple of pilots, but let me tell you a true story of what happened flying in the T-38. So this is the airplane that we fly in, we've got a front seat pilot, back seat pilot, we alternate pilot and command, and uh, the flying pilot I should say, and uh, in this particular situation I was in the back seat of the T-38, I was not the flying pilot, I was the pilot that was assigned to doing the radio and the navigation tasks. And we're on the downwind leg, which basically means that we're coming into land and you fly a rectangle. So you fly along like this, you turn base, then you turn back to land. So we're flying on the downwind leg and I say to the front seat pilot, three green, no flaps, clear to land. And it's very operational communication, three green, no flaps, clear to land. And uh, what, what uh, we should tweak on is the fact that no flaps were set. Normally the three green means that your landing gear are down and locked. Flaps are always a good idea in an airplane because it helps the airplane stay in the air. And uh, you can still land with no flaps, but you need a little more power to do it. And uh, clear to land, it's always good to be clear to land, right? So anyway, three bits of critical communication. Don't think anything about it. I, my brain was sort of thinking, gee, you know, we didn't brief uh, no flap landing, but if the pilot in command wants to do no flap landing, fine with me. So anyway, we turn on base and I say the same thing. Three green, no flaps, clear to land. Turn on final, three green, no flaps, clear to land, we land. No big deal, get out of the airplane, and the person in the front seat turns to me and says, why did you let me land with no flaps? And I said, well, wait a sec, I told you three times. I said, no you didn't, yes I did, and if you have young children, you know that this never really works, right? <laughs> yes I did, no you didn't, yeah, 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 fine. So we just said, okay, well, you know, a learning point, and that was it, thank you very much, and I left. And I was driving away in the car, and I'm thinking, okay, I could easily tell myself I told the front seat pilot three times what they should do. What did I do wrong? I never closed the loop in communication. I never verified they understood what I said. So it turns out they were thinking of other things and also the way I said it, three green no flaps clear to land, three green no flaps clear to land, I mean it's so horrific, right? I'm going to hypnotize you by saying three green no flaps clear to land. So what I should have done, the first time was okay, second time arguably okay, third time I should have said the landing gear is down, I see that you have selected no flaps and you are cleared to land, do you want to do a no flap landing? which would have taken me 30 seconds to say instead of 10 seconds to say. And we would have closed the loop and we would have made a knowledgeable choice as opposed to simply landing by the seat of our pants and doing a no flap landing which worked out fine. Right? Closing the loop. Is this important in medicine? You betcha. Happens all the time. Can I have uh, 0.5 milligrams of atropine? And did that atropine, can I sign it off? Oh, it never got given. What do you mean it never got, I, I said no, I never heard. So these are sorts of things that are really critical for us in healthcare to make sure that we're always closing the loop and understanding what people uh, mean. Never events. We talk about these in the space program as never events should never happen. All right? That's why it's called a never event. In healthcare, there are such things as never events. You know, if you leave an instrument in somebody's abdomen when you're performing surgery, that should never happen. So we call it a never event. If you do surgery on the wrong limb, that's a never event. We <laughs> never happen. Right? So what's the story with this uh, crew lock bag? Well, this is a $150,000 crew lock bag. The price is somewhat irrelevant, but anyway, it used to be in here, and you can see the little tether on the inside of the crew lock bag. And what happened was the uh, astronaut who did this, who by the way is an outstanding spacewalker, truly, I wish I were as good as she is. Anyway, she reached in to grab this bag, pulls it out, and knows that the bag is tethered. She knows it in her head that apparently it's been checked by somebody else before it got put in there and uh, she pulls it out, releases it and as she releases it sees that it's not tethered and then tries to grab it again and then it disappears. Now, you know when something like this happens in space and we're doing this live on TV so the reporters from all over the world are reporting this to the world's media, you know that you're going to hear about this in the end. 
Why do I tell you this story? Because she was truly an incredible spacewalker. We are trained to make sure that we put these events behind us. We prevent the cascade of errors. So she looked at this, went, nothing I can do about it, went back and finished the rest of her spacewalk flawlessly, made no mistakes. It wasn't her fault that this happened. It was just a consequence of a couple of things didn't get done that should have been done inside the spacecraft. So it's all about that team working together to prevent these never events from taking place. So in the space program we talk a lot about the knowing doing gap. Do we know what we need to do? And if we do know what we need to do, are we doing it? And if we're not doing it, why are we not doing it? And I think the same is true in healthcare, that we can do research. If we don't know what to do, let's go off and do research and figure out what we need to do. But if we've done the research and we know what we need to do, we can then ask the question, why are we not doing it if we're not doing it, or are we doing it? And these are all very important principles to bring together in how teams function. There's a lot of attention now in healthcare talking about leadership. Great thing, we should be talking about leadership. The Ontario Medical Association is training physicians in leadership, nursing associations, training people in leadership, Canadian Medical Association, everybody's focusing on leadership, which is great. We're forgetting the other half of the equation, followership. So my daughter is now 14, but when she was 10 years old, you know, I had to go in for the parent briefing, you know, you get the report card and you go in for the parent briefing. And She was doing well in school, it wasn't a problem or anything, so I go in and I sit down on the little elementary school chairs because the teachers make you do that and say, well, you know, Dr. Williams, your daughter's doing very well and I'm so proud, right, as a parent, you're just so thrilled. And uh, the teacher goes on to say, she's doing really, really well in leadership, and though I'm beaming now, right? So I say, how's she doing in followership? Total silence. <laughs> what? I said, followership. What's that? And I would submit that many of us don't talk about followership. In the space program, we not only talk about it, we train it. And followership, essentially, is a personal commitment in the space program we expected of individuals to courageously contribute in a collaborative team environment. Kind of put that definition together just anecdotally because it uh, denotes what it's all about. Courage. Why is it courageous? Well, you know, I try not to be an intimidating leader, but some people feel intimidated by a CEO. And if you're sitting around the table presenting, and I have one idea that might not make a lot of sense for the organization, does it take courage for somebody to speak up and say, uh, Dave, you know, you're way off base here, buddy. You might want to refocus and think about this a little bit differently. Yes, it takes courage. So I think one of the things that's really interesting is when you tell people, we expect you to speak up part of your job to challenge us to make sure that everything is being done in the safest possible manner that's going to give us the highest quality outcome. Active followership, something that I think we should embrace. High maintenance personalities, you know. People once asked me, they said, what's a great astronaut? A great astronaut is somebody who's technically competent with a low maintenance personality. So, do you want to go to Mars with somebody like this? No. Do you, do you want to go to space for two weeks with somebody? No. So I think one of the challenges that we face in healthcare is to make sure that at all times we strive to be low maintenance, easy to get along with, easy to function. And it's tough, and we created this list of attributes of low maintenance folks, and it's tough because at any given time, any one of us can slip into being high maintenance under the wrong set of circumstances. But just anecdotally, we notice that some of our best space station astronauts are the ones who continuously arrive on time. You know, everybody's late every now and then, but if you're chronically, habitually late, coming in 15 minutes after the briefing has started, talking on your cell phone, disrupting everybody, ten, you tend to be more self-focused than team-focused. And of course, in space, you need to be team-focused. And I think if you go down this list and ask the question, are these good attributes of healthcare professionals and leaders in life sciences and, and healthcare? Of course they are. And I want to draw your attention to the last one, creates positive energy. What do you, what's that all about? positive emotional energy. So I used to wonder when I was an eMERGE doc, you know, Friday night, night shift, are the nurses all bidding off? They, they call in ahead of time and go, who's on Friday night? It's a full moon. Williams, oh no, I'm calling in sick. I can't, there's no way I'm working with this guy, right? Or do I create an environment where everybody wants to be there and they're excited and they go, who's on? It's Dave, oh fantastic, we're gonna have cookies and it'll be a great time. Positive emotional energy. And we have to ask ourselves, when we enter a team environment, do you have like a neutral impact? Do you make everybody feel good or do you make everybody feel bad? 
And it's all part of being a low maintenance individual. So these are the attributes we talk about and we train in the space program to optimize our results. Human factors in medicine is just as important as it is in uh, aviation. And that's one of the things that we're very excited about. Am I in an operational environment in an operating room? You're darn tootin' I am. Am I in an operational environment in an ICU? Emergency room, trauma room, of course we are. So all the information that I'm sharing with you that comes from aerospace, we can directly bring it over into healthcare and really improve the quality of the services that we're able to deliver. We are very passionate about error trapping, so we ask ourselves why people make mistakes. We study this to try and learn from error so that we can prevent misadventures from the future. When I went to medical school, you've got it right there. If you remember those two lines, you've had the whole course on safety, quality, and error in medicine. First, do no harm. Seems fairly simple. Errors of omission or commission. In other words, you know, don't do something that you uh, shouldn't have done, and don't forget to do something that you should have done. And that was it. That's how we were trained. And obviously, as you get a sense, it's a lot more complex than that. Because if we have adverse events, it can cause unintended injuries. And worst case scenario, it can lead to death. So we're very passionate in what we're doing, both at Stevenson and Southlake, in talking about all these different phenomena and learning. We have an active learning program in place to talk about personal error, how we can decrease that to talk about latent errors. These are things that are inherent in the environment that we work in that we need to change. It could be poor design, incorrect installation, faulty maintenance. I was talking to one um, at one hospital and it turns out they just bought an operating room table where it was very hard to tell which end the head goes on and which end the feet go on. But if you put the patient on the wrong way around with the head where the feet should be, the table falls over. <laughs> right? I would say that's probably a bad design, right? <laughs> That's what we call latent factor. And yet these things happen. I mean, this story is within the last five years. So these things happen. And we in healthcare need to be very vigilant to make sure that these don't uh, cause situations that harm our patients. Fatigue is one of the biggest problems we face in the aerospace industry. And I think we face the same reality in healthcare. And I know some of us who work in healthcare are going to say to me, Dave, come on, get a grip. You were an eMERGE doc. You know what it's like. You're so chronically tired because you're working on shifts. How can you tell me not to work when I'm tired? I'm not telling you not to work when you're tired because that's very challenging. We're working on a solution to that one. What I am saying though is what we learn in the space program is when you're really fatigued you need to create redundancies so that you're not the only person involved in making critical decisions. So when I was in space as a physician, I treated people in space, I made sure that I actually used my patient as the redundancy. And I would, I'd be willing to bet that if any of you were my patient and I said to you, I'm about to give you an intravenous injection of this medication to do the following, this is the name of the medication, do you agree? Would anyone be upset if I did that? I mean, really, it's, it's okay to answer. <laughs> no? Because I can't imagine why anyone would. Nobody in space ever, they, they didn't think less of me as a doctor. They didn't think that, oh, he's really asking me what medication to use. Because I was using them as a redundancy to make sure that we were doing the right thing. And I think that's something really interesting is learning how to do that. This is something my wife says every day she goes to work. Gets on the 767, looks at the crew and says, if anybody sees anything at any point in time they don't like, just tell me. We do it all the time in spaceflight. If anybody sees anything you don't like, just tell me. As a physician, I never used that phrase once. Never. Didn't even know it existed. I became a pilot after I was a physician. Once I became a pilot, this phrase entered my vocabulary. And I would submit that if we're working in the operating room, we should add that phrase to our vocabulary. So just speak up. What would be wrong with the surgeon saying, you know what, guys, if there's anything you don't like here, just tell me. So I think what's exciting about the environments that we're working in are we can implement change like this very quickly in the clinical world. And there's sometimes, of course, in the operating room where you just have to be quiet. We're doing a really complex procedure. We want you to um, just stay quiet for a sec and we're only going to focus on what we're doing right now. In aviation, we call it a sterile cockpit. We only have mission critical communication happening. So again, the lessons that we learn can be transferred across. We do pre-briefing all the time in aviation. In medicine, we're beginning to get there now where we start doing team briefing ahead of time and we're starting to do post-briefing after events. So we're implementing this program. And I think what's really exciting recently in the past few years is you're seeing the implementation of the safe surgical 
technical checklist, which of course we're using, and uh, that helps us do a pre-brief, it helps us do a debrief, it's a checklist, just like we would use in aviation to make sure that we minimize the probability of error when we're performing surgery. There's actually now a program out where we talk about behavioral competencies for healthcare professionals. It's called non-technical skills for surgeons. Teaching surgeons and nurses in the OR how to work together in peak performing teams, how to close the loop in communication, how to make sure that they're doing everything really well. And I think what's exciting is that we can take programs like this, be able to implement them clinically, and really improve the quality that we're able to deliver to our patients. At uh, South Lake and Stevenson, we talk about interprofessional practice, how we're all working together in the same team as healthcare professionals. Everyone's a valued member of the team. We expect followership. We expect you to speak up. We expect you to say something that you're not happy with because it can help improve the outcome. And in the end, it's really all about collaboration, just like we do in the space program, learning to work together to achieve these results. Building partnerships, absolutely critical. And when I came on at uh, South Lake, I was thrilled to learn about the relationship between Stevenson and uh, Southlake because it's a great opportunity to go from where we are today to continue to build that relationship in a manner that's uh, mutually beneficial for both organizations. So we've had a very strong focus on hand washing. You remember the knowing doing gap? Is there anybody that doesn't know we need to wash our hands before we see a patient? If so, come talk to me after. I'll help. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I think everybody knows, right? So if we know what we need to do, why aren't we doing it? So we've talked about this, and we've got a lot of communication going on. And uh, right now, I'm working um, to implement the program that we have for hand washing with the infection control team at Stevenson. The results are now up to 87%. That's well beyond your average hospital. It's fantastic. But again, it indicates that the team responds when we sit down and we talk about something and why it's important and identify the expected behavior. So at Stevenson, what's really exciting is working together over the past four years with Gary and Annette and the team, we've really worked hard and focusing on quality and risk, went through the accreditation process, did really well. We're enhancing the training and the education that's available for all the staff, for the staff at Stevenson, for the staff at South Lake. What I think is really refreshing is when we're doing a briefing and we've got members of both teams in the briefing, which is great. And you know, I'm working at South Lake, I'm here tonight. I think that's really exciting to be able to do. And I have my Stevenson parking pass. <laughs> Gotta love that, right? It's a good thing. <laughs> Patient satisfaction scores are going up. As you know, we're sharing IT, we're sharing human resources and occupational health services. So as a result, our recruitment's up. We got 93% score on a recent WSIB work well audit. So all the indicators are positive to indicate that, you know what, the partnership's working. And that just reinforces what we learned in the space program. The partnership works. Right? And in the space program, we had much greater challenges with partnerships than we do between Stevenson and Southlake. We're talking about having ru the Russian space program working with the U.S. space program, with Canada, with Europe, Japan, all these partners all over the world that don't even speak the same language. So I think it's really exciting. Partners in care. We talk a lot about transitions in care between institutions. And I think what's interesting is we've established very effective relationships in these four clinical areas, GI we're building right now, but uh, in these four areas, where patients may come from Stevenson to Southlake to get some care, come back to Stevenson. We may have physicians or other healthcare professionals coming from South Lake to Alliston to provide care here, and it's working really, really well. So it's all about partners and uh, working together in close partnership to be able to achieve these results. So in closing, I'd like to show you a video. And to me, it celebrates the culture that we've created at Stevenson, a culture that focuses on safety and quality, a culture that focuses on putting our patients first and making sure that we're able to provide our best to our patients.
So thanks for having me tonight. It's been a real pleasure sharing with you some of my experiences from the space program, but I've been really, really excited to share with you how effectively the partnership is working between the two institutions and how in both institutions, the healthcare team is doing an incredible job relentlessly pursuing safety and quality to make sure we're able to do the best we can for our patients and their families. Thanks very, very much for coming. Yeah. I'm just a little curious, um, Dr. Williams. You talked about deviations and accepting deviations. Um, in, in the audit of the hand washing, I think it was at 87 or 89%. Mm -hmm. um, I think to most of us, that seems like a fairly simple thing to do wash your hands every time you see a patient. Is that becoming an accepted deviation? I know the target is 100%, but. How does one get to that 100% target? Yeah, great question. So let me, I'll use the South Lake numbers because I'm much more familiar with the South Lake numbers than I am uh, with Stevenson's numbers. In April of this year, just to give you an idea, data point, South Lake was 59% compliant institutionally with our hand washing protocols. And we do independent audits, so we have auditors going out looking at uh, <coughs> what's going on to make sure people are doing it properly. 59%. That's probably average for most healthcare institutions. You know, everybody's kind of bumping around the 50 to 60, 70% range. And uh, today, I can tell you that um, at South Lake we've hit 94%. We have four parts of the hospital that are at 100%, and we're tracking this, and our goal is 100% compliance. Now, remember, you've got you know, th over 3,000 people working at South Lake. Stevenson is a large team as well, not as large as we have, but we target 100% and we train for 100% and we work towards 100%. We talk about 100%. The analogy that I use when we're talking about this is to say, if I'm going to take any one of you up flying, which I'd be more than happy to do tomorrow, would you like me to put the landing gear down 87% of the time or 94% of the time? Right? You know, it's an either or. And, and I think what's interesting about hand washing is we can push to try and achieve that. And then the really interesting question is from, from a management perspective, if you're not achieving 100%, what should we do? Do you run in and beat up the team and say, you know, you're not doing 100% and yell and scream? Or should we go in and sit down and say, what can we do to help you achieve 100%? Are there problems with your environment? Do you not have enough hand washing dispensers? Are they in the wrong place? Is it inconvenient? And that's the approach that we're taking is again, communicating with the frontline folks to say, what can we do to help you achieve that target? As opposed to the, let's just beat you up because you're not getting to a 100% approach. Great question though. And we, we will get there. Stevenson will get there, South Lake will get there, and we're gonna be thrilled when we're there. Dr. Williams, how would you lead the people at your hospital to truly live the expression, we must go beyond good enough, we cannot stop at good enough? So that's a great question. To me, it's a relentless commitment. And as leaders, we have to be committed personally to achieving excellence. And it all starts with simple things. So if I come over to Stevenson, I walk into the emergency room and I've got my sleeves down, my ring on, my watch in place, and I don't spritz my hands with the alcohol solution, that sends a message. That sends the message that the CEO thinks it's okay to walk into an emergency room without doing that. So it's all about messaging, it's all about the behaviors we have. I subscribe to the reverse pyramid model of leadership. I'm quite happy to do the regular pyramid model of leadership, so in case of emergency, yeah, I'm more than happy to do all that. But in general, in leadership, you're better off spending more time listening and more time getting out and talking to people than standing talking and telling people what to do. And I think it's very important for creating a, an environment where the culture is committed to achieving excellence to be able to model that, to listen, to ask a lot of questions and see what we can do to foster that environment of excellence. And I think the reason why I mention culture so much is because I learned when I was in management at NASA, you know, you think you make all these great changes, right? So I leave, I go fly in space again, and I call back, you know, 10 years later, and I say, which programs that I implemented are still in place? And there are some. 
I can count them on less than one hand, but there are some, which is good. So I made a difference, a long-term difference, but that's how you, you change the culture to create the long-term difference. So if we create a culture of safety and quality where it doesn't depend on Dave, it doesn't depend on Annette, it depends on everybody in the team, then all of a sudden we will have succeeded. And that's why it's so exciting because we're all in this together. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm just a member of the team like everybody else. And we need to encourage and challenge each other so that if I go into the patient's room not washing my hands, the nurse will feel empowered to say to me, hey Dave, would you mind washing your hands? Oh, thank you very much, I forgot. And then no big deal, you wash your hands, away you go. So it's all about communication and role modeling and being an effective leader, I think. That's a great question and I, I, when I was 50 years old, became a patient myself so I understand exactly what you're talking about when the cleaner's wearing greens and your surgeon's wearing greens and you're wondering, wait a minute, like, who's who here? And uh, so it's a very important issue and we're looking at that, you know, we talk about dress code and, and what we need to be doing to make sure that people are identifiable and that you can identify the people, whether it's that you print something on their name tag that indicates the role that they have as a healthcare professional or whether it's something that's on the uniform itself, but that's a direction that yes, we will look at that. It's, it wasn't on my first 100 day plan at Southlake, nor here, but it's something that we'll be looking at because I think it is important. We need to be able to do that. The other obvious thing is that as a healthcare professional, we should introduce ourselves and let the patient know who we are, you know, and th there's that element of it. And as patients, we should not feel intimidated to ask. And who are you? You know, why are you here? What are you doing? And things. And I think that's a very important element as well as empowering patients to speak up. And I would love to create an environment where our patients will challenge us to ask the question, have you washed your hands? When I was an emergency physician, we had the sinks in the room. So I used to, it was my habit pattern to walk in the room and wash my hands in front of the patient. And then once I was finished with the patient, again, wash my hands before I left the room so they could see visually what was going on. And it was a great time to just say hello and build rapport while I'm washing my hands and then sit down and be able to talk to the patient. But very important issues like that we need to be able to respond to in healthcare. Uh, I realize it's 30 days and you've got a, a major changing of the guard going on here, but I just wondered whether so far you've been able to identify what you think is the next great opportunity with this partnership. Great question. So my first 100 days at Southlake and I would say the same for my relationship with Stevenson, has really been to focus on safety quality and then to build the partnership. And build the partnership in a way in which we can demonstrate to other elements of the healthcare organization how effective clinical partnerships can really be. You know, in, in healthcare, we face a $47 trillion problem over the next 20 years. 47 trillion globally on managing chronic disease, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, respiratory illness, mental health. The solution to a $47 trillion problem doesn't exist today. We have to figure it out. And that's what I think is really exciting about the relationship between Stevenson and South Lake. We're beginning to figure out different models of delivering care where we can optimize our ability to provide high quality care to patients and uh, make sure that we're able to follow their patient in the continuum of care between the two institutions. <clears throat> Excuse me, in that model, you'll hear a lot more from Kevin Smith about that in February. Kevin, uh, for those of you who don't know, I worked for Kevin at St. Joe's Healthcare Hamilton and uh, St. Mary's in Kitchener-Waterloo is part of the St. Joe's Healthcare system. I used to work at St. Mary's as well. And I think coming up with those creative new models, the partnerships for the future are very exciting. And I would be as bold is to say, when we look at Stevens and the hospital today, great hospital, great people, we might want to start thinking about a new physical plant, but thinking about that physical plant in the context of hospitals of the future. And there's actually now a new field of architecture that focuses on designing hospitals that are optimized to del deliver lean, efficient healthcare services. So we've got a great opportunity to start looking at that as well in terms of our strategic planning. So I think there's huge opportunity for us to be able to demonstrate to others how we can succeed working together. That's great. Great question. I think that's a great segue. Thank yep, you, Dave. Perfect. Into our next two speaker series. So the next one is December 6th, next Tuesday evening, 7 to 9, same place. 
uh, same location. And uh, please join me in a very big thank you to Dave with a very excellent